Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very special mini-sode of Masters of Carpentry. I am Alex. Julia will not be joining us for this particular episode, but joined with me, as always, is my co-host, Noel. Yes, we are here to discuss Thing from Another World from 1951. And yeah, this is going to be interesting. It's a little halfway episode between John Acrofa and Masters of Carpentry. Mm -hmm. Not quite one, not quite the other. We'll, we'll have a little fun here. A little surprise, a little Kinder Egg surprise. Yes. The film was released in April 6th of 1951. It was actually the same year that Day the Earth Stood Still came out, and Thing actually beat it at the box office. I read that, yeah. Impressive. Probably the most prominent person to mention about the film is Howard Hawks who produced the film and some debate did more. In a career spanning from 1926 to 1977, Hawks was one of Hollywood's earliest A-list directors with classics to his name such as Scarface, Bringing Up Baby, Only Angels Have Wings, His Girl Friday, Sergeant York, The Big Sleep, Red River, I Was a Male War Bride, Rio Bravo, Hatari, El Dorado, and Rio Lobo. The film was directed by Christian Nyby, who was Hawks' editor on four films, this was Nyby's directorial debut, and he went on to a long career directing television with episodes among Gunsmoke, Wagon Train, Twilight Zone, Lassie, I Spy, Bonanza, and The Six Million Dollar Man. And the big debate is how much of this film was actually directed by Nyby and how much was actually directed by Hawks. And it's hmm. kind of an interesting mirror of that. Did Spielberg direct Poltergeist or did Toby Hooper? Mm-hmm. It's split between the actors. Some of the actors say it was all Howard Hawks. Some of the actors say it was all Christian Nyby. Christian Nyby himself said he directed it, but Hawks was on set all the time, was supervising, and Nyby idolized Hawks hmm. and would always go to Hawks to get feedback and opinions, but Hawks would still let Nyby have the final say. It's very much a Howard Hawks film, but it's made by someone who worked with Hawks. It's made by someone who knew Hawks' style. It's someone who cut Hawks' films. And Hawks was there helping out. And then also, one of the big things is that Hawks probably wouldn't have signed on to this film anyways, because at the period it was still seen as a B sci-fi movie, while he was an A-list director of top-tier pictures, and that would have been a step down for him. So having a film that he produced, that he supervised the script, that he supervised the director on, that's still essentially one of his films, just not made by him, wouldn't have really hurt his career at all. The original novella, Who Goes There, was written by John W. Campbell Jr., who was born in New Jersey in 1910, and by his early 20s had become a successful author with numerous space opera adventure stories and novels serialized in the sci-fi mags, amazing stories, astounding stories, and thrilling wonder stories. After a decade of output, Campbell shifted directions in 1938 when he became the editor of Astounding, and his own stories came to a stop within the next year. Among his sci-fi adventure stories, he also wrote tales with a darker horror tone under the name Don A. Stewart, a reference to his then-wife, Donna Stewart. And near the end of his writing, one such horror story was Who Goes There, first published in Astounding in 1938. I was debating whether or not to do an entire Genocrypha episode just covering the original novella, but so much of that novella is in this film and the next film that I think I'll just wait till the end of this episode and just kind of point out some little differences here and there. Alex, is this a film that you had seen before? Never. Always meant to, but never did. This has been one of my favorite films since my early teens, because I got into the novella thing and thing from another world right around the same time. I've kind of always been fascinated by their relationship to one another. This is a film I've probably seen only slightly less often than <laughs> I've seen John Carpenter's thing. And even the novella, this was like probably the fifth or sixth time I read it. So, I mean, this is a franchise I'm very much familiar with. And it's always fun to dig it out again. I look forward to hearing what you think of it in a minute. All right. I'm excited to talk about it. Instrumentation at a scientific outpost in the North Pole picks up the crash of some form of aircraft nearby, and Air Force Captain Patrick Hendry and his team are flown in to investigate. The craft turns out to be a flying saucer now embedded in the ice. 
Attempting to free the craft with a thermite bomb, a chemical reaction ends up destroying the ship. Nearby, however, the body of one of the saucer's occupants is also found in the ice, and the thing is dug up in a block. Dragging the block back to base, Hendry begins clashing with the supervising scientist Arthur Carrington, who wants to melt free and examine the thing. Hendry would rather wait for orders from his superiors, which are delayed as a storm rolls in and blows out the radios. Guards are posted around the refrigerated block, but when one man covers the disturbing thing with a sheet, he doesn't realize the blanket is electric. The thing is quickly melted and burst out into the snow even as men fill it full of bullets, and has a skirmish with sled dogs where its arm is torn off. The arm is recovered and examined, revealing the thing is a plant who lives off of blood. Carrington and his scientists feel the thing has been victimized, but Hendry and the soldiers feel it's violent and want to capture or stop it if they can. The situation escalates as the thing attacks several times, killing several men and draining them of blood. Carrington also starts covering for the thing and uses plasma samples and starts growing seedlings from the severed arm. Ultimately, after the thing cuts the outpost heaters, it's decided to lure him onto a platform where he'll be boiled down by high-voltage electricity. Carrington attempts to intervene, but he's knocked aside as the creature is reduced to a smoldering lump. Finally regaining contact with frantic commanders on the outside, reporter Scotty broadcasts a warning to the world, Watch the skies. So Alex, do you recommend this movie? I do. I um, was kind of on the fence at certain parts in the movie. That's a very precarious position coming into a well-regarded classic so late in the game. You I almost don't know how to take it in a certain way. I didn't really know the historical significance, like where mm -hmm. it came from. So that kind of colored my view as well. And at times, to me, it was almost another scene of them walking down a hallway because that's what the sets they have. But as the film went on, I began to appreciate its strengths, like the overlapping dialogue, which you did not hear back then, where it was kind of like a play. The whole idea of the creature was very advanced for the films of the time. The fact that it was like a vegetable, that they went into the scientific background of the creature. And the jump scares were terrific for 1951. And the ending is just balls out amazing. <laughs> I also recommend the film, too. The science of its science fiction is a little hit or miss wishy-washy, but so little of the film is about that. I just appreciated that it took a different term other than just, like, alien from another planet that they were actually trying to go through, like, the biology of it. And a lot of it, of course, doesn't make any sense. But uh... What I like is that the characters are fully acknowledging, now wait, you're talking about a carrot? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they can joke about it, which is another thing I really liked about the movie. It has a great sense of humor. I love the pace of it. Hawks has always had a very simple style. Mm -hmm. There's nothing really flashy about his camera work, but he stages things very well. Like, as you said, like a play, like even during the big climax where it's just basically a single shot down a single hallway as people are coming left and right, up and down, setting up the tracks, mm -hmm. setting up all the insulation. But what I love is how crowded this cast is, too. Yes. It's like 20, 25 people all like usually gathered in a room versus this one thing. And yeah, his timing is perfect in terms of just when he punches out the thing. And the thing, yeah, it's a very simple makeup design, but the way it's used is so effective. The way they'll suddenly just pop him out at you or suddenly throw open a door and there's a silhouette. Because mm -hmm. I was going to say the old cliche of how they don't use him. That's amazing because he just comes out of nowhere sometimes. I even love that one bit where they catch him on the uh, Geiger counter, mm -hmm. you know, coming towards the room. So they're like, quick, turn off the lights mm -hmm. just as the door throws open. And there he is. And then like within a second, they've set him in half the room on fire. Which is exactly how a scene would actually play out like that. It would get yeah. right out of control very quickly. <laughs> and the dialogue that you mentioned was one of Hawks' trademarks. Oh, yeah? Every one of his films had that rat-a-tat patter dialogue. That was even for the period was very standout because he would let his actors improvise. He would get a lot of very theatrically trained actors and they would all work through improv sessions to build the dialogue, to build this momentum to the way the scenes come out. It's terrific. Oh, yeah. And he had this whole stable of actors who would be in all of his films just because there were so many actors who just couldn't deliver his dialogue. Mm hmm. I love the scenes where you just have, like, suddenly 30 people all in a room just bouncing off one another. Mm -hmm. And that made it very realistic and set it apart from a lot of films in my mind, especially at the time. Oh, yeah. And I even just love a lot of the small characters, like the reporter. Mm -hmm. He just wants to tell his damn story. Yeah. Or, like, the two guys who are the best friends of the lead guy just joshing him for having a girlfriend on the base. Yeah. Even just the scene between him and the woman on the base, which got surprisingly kinky at times. She was fan 
fantastic, way mm. ahead of the time. She was just like, oh, I brought you guys coffee. You just wanted to get in the room, right? Yep. <laughs> yep. And also, by the way, I brought a rope so I can tie you up. Oh, yeah. She was really good with him because she was basically the aggressor in that relationship. And it was yeah. awesome. He was just like, leave me alone. She's like, nah. No, and that was what was cool was I was flipping through the early draft of the script. And as written, it was more your typical, he's the studly guy. She's mm-hmm. the, oh, John. And no, they turned it. She's the one who's pursuing him, aggressive against him. Yep. I love that whole story of how she outdrank him. He passed out and she left a note on him saying how lovely his legs were. Uh-huh. And half of the platoon just walked by and read it. Yeah. <laughs> she's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. And I should point out Kenneth Toby as Henry. I love Kenneth Toby. This was his first lead role. Oh, yeah? He was a theater actor and had only done a few bit parts here and there. Cox loved him and wanted to try and find a perfect vehicle for him. That's what's great about this film is because it's a lower budget B-movie, he was able to give these big significant roles to actors who had never really had a big role before. Like the reporter guy was just a bit player, a stand-in in a lot of movies, and here he gets this big role. Margaret Sheridan as Nikki was someone that he was trying to make into a leading lady, but was just never able to get big roles. Here he found a spot for her. That's great. Robert Cornthwaite as Dr. Carrington. Big role. And he had only just had little bit parts like the old man, the guy down the street. <laughs> Most of these actors then went on to have these really great careers. Like Kenneth Toby and Robert Cornthwaite kept acting up till the late 90s. Wow. When they were like both in their 80s. That's impressive. There is not much to the plot. No, definitely not. Though I do love, as much as I say, you know, some of the science fiction is a little wobbly, mostly in terms of where you get the severed hand and they make the little mm-hmm. seed pods. And I love the iconic scene of they find the flying saucer in order to determine its shape. Let's stand around it. And then they realize they're in a circle. That scene was perfect. I love that. Just the way they did it. The score worked perfectly. It was very like pre-Spielberg Spielberg. It kind of gave the gravity of the situation. That was classic 50 sci-fi. And then just the whole thing of, it's almost like a perfect sphere. Yeah, exactly. Wait, it is a perfect sphere. Dun, dun, oh dun. Oh my God. <laughs> No, I really like that. And there's a lot of like scenes that kind of reminded me of the thing that we I'm more familiar with the 80s thing Mm -hmm. where they drag out the tension so much that you forget you're supposed to be tense and then they hit you like the scene in Carpenter's thing with testing out the blood samples. Yes. Was them just casually walking down the hall, psyching themselves up, then kind of like whatever, and then opening the door and it's just there. (laughs) Yep. And that was great. Oh, yeah. And then he, like, slams his fist into the door frame and tears off part of it. Yeah, and it's not even just him slamming his fist into the door frame. It's when he pulls back, it comes out. That gives it the right. scope of the strength of the creature. James Arness, the star of Gunsmoke, this is one of his first roles. He actually went on to become a leading man. Oh, nice. He was just this very tall actor who just had a hard time finding work early in his career because of his height. Mm-hmm. So he did one monster role, but then he got cast in Gunsmoke and became a, a very slick leading man. And he's never been a fan of this. Because he basically said, I just put putty on my nose and played a carrot. (laughs) Uh, I could see that at the time. It's like Alec Guinness. Though I do love the bit at the end where they're all prepping for the creature at the end of the hallway. And they have this whole door that's nailed up. And he just opens it from the other side. (laughs) He doesn't even burst through it. He's just like, oh, you guys nailed the wrong side of the door. (laughs) (laughs) And now I have a club. And then he's just walking there with this big chunk of wood in his hand. Yeah. Yeah. I like that the cast is a bunch of Kurt Russells. Like, everyone's kind of a Kurt Russell in this cast, even the female lead, which was nice to have a woman there because it's such a sausage party and the other thing. And Howard Hawks is one of Carpenter's biggest inspirations. So many of his films, especially Assault and Precinct 13, so you can see a lot of pre-Lee here. Mm -hmm. I even just like the quiet horror of scenes like the scientist trying to cover a secret, and it ends up with two of them strung from their heels with their throat slit being drained of blood. Yeah. Which you never see, but it's just the horror of hearing that. And then the whole military versus science. Mm -hmm. But it never falls into like this easy thing because a lot of the scientists are like, dude, what are you doing? Yeah. The military guys are like, dude, what are we doing? Yeah. It's more ego than trying to like say that scientists are bad. It's egos in a confined space going at it. Mm -hmm. And even just like the ending where the great effect of them just shocking him down into this little molten ball. Oh, yeah. More so than that, though, the fire scene. I did not see that coming. Oh, yeah. So impressive. Because that fire just spreads like 
Like, yeah. like wildfire. And they keep hitting him. They keep hitting him with fire in the face, and it's great. <laughs> they set him on fire and then just start splashing him with buckets of gasoline. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, holy shit. And, th- and that was one of the first full body burns of a stuntman in a movie. Oh, really? I could see that for sure. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Ah, I'm glad I did, too. It was a very fine film. I'm really uh, dipping my toe into, like, early science fiction like that. And between that and Forbidden Planet, I've Ooh. had really good results so far. <laughs> May I recommend Them? Oh, the, is that The Big Ants? The Big Ants. That's on my list, yeah. Which sounds silly, but is one of the smartest, most exciting sci-fi action movies of all time, even holds up to this day. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah, them and The Day the Earth Stood Still are both like the highest on my list from what I've heard from people. <laughs> I'm going to see it. I have to. It's been recommended. <laughs> the Earth Stood not bad. Yeah. <laughs> But them holds up well. The thing, what I love is that even though it's a very old-fashioned movie, it still holds up really well because there's little happening, but it has a rapid pace. Yeah. There's a lot of momentum to it. Absolutely. It's a very relevatory to me that you can have an effective horror film, which is basically about the situation getting slowly more and more out of control, and they don't overreact to it, which I like. They're kind of jokey up until like certain points where things are out of their control, but it doesn't have a high body count, and they show only a little bit. It, and I found that to be way more effective than most horror films. Yeah, you only see the thing four times. Yep, it's true. And it was just enough. In one doorway, in another doorway, fighting the dogs, and at the end. The fighting the dogs was a really good scene as well. I like that they showed that aspect of it, because just seeing something doing that out there was just chilling enough. With the ferocity of the animals, and then the fact that they tore off his arm. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was rooting for those dogs. <laughs> yeah. And then I even just love the subtle bit of they go and they examine the greenhouse and only one guy realizes that the thing has been in and out of this place mm-hmm. and keeps it a secret. And then they find the dead dog and it's like, oh, oh, what's going to happen here? Yeah. And I even just love the playing of the big storm outside so you can't radio for help. And they keep getting these conflicting orders that basically tell them to do things that they've already done or that have failed. Which is shades of later alien plots and stuff mm-hmm. like that of the company or whatever, giving the dictated yeah. orders, which put their team in jeopardy. <laughs> so I love that a lot of those orders are coming from the guy who is introduced in the movie by always shouting, close that door. <laughs> like, well, don't have a door in the Arctic. Exactly. Get a second door. Make a little airlock. I liked it that they went to the base because I'm like, these guys are walking around in overcoats and just regular glass and wood doors. It doesn't really give a sense of how actually cold it is out there. And then when they actually got to the Arctic base, then it made a lot more sense. Oh, that's the other scene that I loved is when the heaters get kicked out, Nikki is the one who realizes it by like pointing out their breath. Mm -hmm. And they think that she's just making a snide comment about their breath. And she's like, no, look, you can see your breath. The heat's out. I was a little snarky about that at first, but I guess with the adrenaline, you wouldn't notice the temperature steadily dropping. Mm -hmm. Any final thoughts? Good movie. Thanks for making me watch it. (laughs) Yeah, thank you for volunteering to watch it. There's not a lot to the movie, but it's just, it's such a good time. Yeah, no, it's got a lot of great elements to it that you didn't really see for the time and still hold up today. Just to get into the novella a bit, I'm not going to get into the whole novella because this is where you get into the tricky things of, is this a remake or is this not? Because the first five chapters are this movie. Okay. And the remainder of the novella is the John Carpenter movie. Okay. The novella is the characters from the John Carpenter movie. You have McCready, you have Blair, you have Knowles, you have all those characters. Mm. But it's a scientific outpost in the Arctic. Mm -hmm. It's in the 30s, so they don't have all the radar, they don't have all the runways and all that stuff. But they do have weather equipment. It's scientists who are out there studying the weather, and their magnometers lead them to this crashed craft that has been there for thousands, if not millions of years. They actually dig up the creature first, which they discover by accidentally planting a pickaxe in its head. <laughs> and they see the craft, and they're almost at the craft, and they can see the craft door is open. And they're just looking into the craft when they set off the thermite. And then the ship goes up, and what's a great scene is that, because they had already dug out the creature by this point, as the ship goes up, it lights up the ice so you can see that there's like seven other creatures around the ship. Oh, man. But they're all pulled into the explosion that takes out the ship, except for the one. Mm-hmm. In the novella, the creature is described as kind of almost golem-like, this kind of shriveled, gnarly thing with blazing red eyes, a snarling mouth, and blue worms for hair. Hmm. As they get back to the base, you start to get the arguments between them in terms of, do we thaw it out? Do we not thaw it out? And it's decided we should thaw it out because 
there's no way we would get this hunk of ice to the mainland with limited refrigeration and preserve it. So they basically want to take the creature apart, dissect it, and pickle it in jars as much as they can. <laughs> as they thaw it out, of course, it wakes up. It gets on the loose. They first find it attacking the dogs. Mm-hmm. While it's fighting the dogs, they pull off a high-voltage cable and electrocute the creature to death. Okay. And so that is basically this movie. They just expanded on that. And then from then on, the dogs who have eaten the creature start to get infected with the thing. And then we start going into the John Carpenter movie. Okay. And then Carpenter, of course, was a fan of this movie. So he just set that all at the Norwegian camp so he wouldn't have to retouch what his favorite director had already done. So it's basically that happens. And now we go on to this next chapter in the story. Exactly. This movie and John Carpenter's movie are the novella. Okay. You put them together. It is the novella. Both are expanded versions of their chunks of the novella, but that is the novella. The prequel movie is an entirely different thing that we will get to later, but yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyways, I think that's all I have to say. Yep, same for me. Well, I think that wraps up this episode of Masters of John Ockerfa (laughs) Carpentry, somewhere in the middle mishmash thingy. Bonus episode. We'll we'll end it on that. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. <laughs>